execution. Hi Tim. Hey, we enjoyed seeing your Coral Aura in Toledo in 2019. Is that model 30 years old now? 1995. It's 27. 27. What was your inspiration? Uh, the inspiration, I guess, was what was going on in the one-to-one -one car world. You know, the, the dominant style at the time was pro street and it had sort of become a a joke of itself everybody was kind of looking for the next big thing the other big thing was all of the great models being built at that time uh, a major inspiration was doug studebaker scale auto issue number 92 august of 1994. Okay. and little did i know i was about to get a junky 61 impala and um, give it the old college drop nice and you built that when you were in college 21 years old i was i was going to the toledo show and in 94 um back in that time you really didn't get you know ebay wasn't a thing and in order to get interesting unique models you had to go to these big shows and um toledo was the big daddy and so um i'm going through the swap meet and uh there's these dudes uh, vending, and I swear they look like roadies from Iron Maiden. <laughs> and he took me aside. I'm looking out at all the stuff, and he says, "Hey man, I got something I think you might want." And he handed me this box, wow. an original '61 Impala convertible. And I opened it up, and windshield frame was busted off, and bumpers were all busted up and it was brush painted black i said how much and he said 15 bucks i said i'll take it <laughs> oh, perfect because you didn't need perfect a pillars anyway i didn't know what i was gonna build at the time uh, um basically everybody was kind of going through bubble top mania the um amt 62 bel air was still a new kid at the time issued in 93 Everybody knows this one. Mm. And when it first came out, I built the uh, built that one stock. And then I took that kit and combined it with a 63 Impala and built a Smoky Unic um, Mystery Motor stock car. Right. And so I kind of had an idea of how that kit went together. And so getting the 61, I said, oh, I will be combined using that another 62 to, to build something a custom out of this. On the bodywork on the car, I mean, you pretty much kept that GM flavor, and it looks like you kind of span from 59 to 62 for all the elements and influences that you brought in there. Once I got the model, it didn't have a top, and I wanted, you know, like I said, everybody was kind of in bubble top mania. And so I remember a Tom Taylor illustration that was called Ultra Street, and he had leaned the glass in and not cut the glass. I took that illustration and said, oh, that's how I'm going to put this together. And so the windows actually had to be glued into the 62 roof so I, they would have enough strength to graft onto the 61 Chevy. Then they were they had to be cut out after the top was on straight and all that kind of stuff. So then the top was reinforced with brass rod from the inside, and that mm. actually made it quite strong. Yeah, that brass rod, I'm sure, made a made a difference doing all that body work that things didn't crack and come apart. And, you know, nearly 30 years later, it's the body work is still pretty, pretty good. <laughs> oh, good <laughs> plan. Good foundation. Considering some of the other ones I've built. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that feeling. One thing I noticed on that car is 
on the windshield and the rear window. There is a clarity for that glass itself. I don't see distortion like you would see in kit glass. And you had mentioned that you vac formed that. I did. Um, again, your your Studebaker was the complete inspiration for all of that. How how you vac formed that roof and turned that made that car so smooth. I knew I was going to have to pull something off like this, and so the kit glass after it was cut off was poxied onto balsa wood, which then I'd carve to make that buck. And a buddy of mine at the time had just gotten an industrial uh, back former, and he was looking for something to try it. And I said, hey, I'm gonna come see you, and I got these things. And so we sat down over the weekend and started pulling, pulling glass for it. And the brass rod in the, in the roof actually holds the the back form windows in the car. So it was kind of a, that actually helped it as well. So basically that, you trimmed out that vac form piece and it just springs in between the brass rod and it holds itself in there. And then the, the interior traps it in as well. I mean, it's such a, a flush fit look to it. You know, it helps that graceful line that just, you know, as it rises from the cowl across the windshield into the roof, it's so smooth. I don't know if it's the black panel or the roof, I think it's all those things together because you wouldn't think that bubble top would have merged well with that year in power. And yet it does. It really does. Color wise on that, I mean, it's the Coral Aura, but you went with a dark two tone? That was always the plan. Is after the body was stripped and I could see how crisp it was. Hmm. I said, oh, this thing's got to be two-tone. You know, I knew it was going to be a dark and a light color. And I hadn't really decided exactly what color, but I knew it was going to be down that character line. And uh, then once the top was done, the trim up on the top, I said, yeah, it has to have the black top on it, too. And that kind of adds yeah. to, I actually have a 68 Impala that has, that's yellow with the black top. So <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> I had to have yeah. that two-tone. It's kind of what kind of makes a lot of these, these cars what they are. Where did the name come from? Did that come first or did your thought for the design come first? The build was going along and I was trying to come up with a name and I was in my art history class and our teacher, Dr. Walter, she would give these very animated lectures and art history was like at eight o'clock in the morning she's up there and just dancing around and she starts talking about people's auras and she grabs a student out of the front row and stands them up and she's like waving her arms all around it's like this is this person's aura 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 and i was already kind of playing around with the idea of painting it a coral type color because that was the you know one of the factory type colors at the time and i wrote coral aura in my notebook You know, the one thing that, that's like off that whole GM track, the wheels. From an unlikely source, you pulled those wheels and they just look great in there. Oh, the wheels were from the BMW Nazca. And again, it was one of the new kits of the time. And um, they fit the car. We were, I was looking for something a little bit larger and that was, you know, the, the giant wheels or the 17, 18 inch, 19 inch wheels hadn't really been invented yet. What was interesting with it is in that kit, they're not plated. And so I had sent them out to be oh, chrome plated by Chrome Tech back in the day. And when they came back and said, oh yeah, they, that, that makes it custom right there. <laughs> Did you also pull the tires from that kit as well? Exactly, the tire, wheels and tires yeah. were both from BMW. Yeah, good combo. I love the fact that, you know, and I have that kit, but I don't recognize those wheels, you know, and that's what makes it really special is the fact that I don't look at that and get tied into, I know where the wheels came from or what that influence was. They are what they are. Yeah. Well, wheels are so important on any model. And basically almost every model I build, I, you know, it's built around the wheels and it might not be a set of we that exact wheel when I'm building it but it's like what the size is gonna be. Uh, it's more of the tires, really. 
it, it all comes down to building something around the tires and then okay yeah. i'll find something that goes inside the tire so you start there and just work your way in <laughs> exactly you start with four tires and and a body and say that's what it's going to be nice that's a good challenge maybe sometime you could do a build where you start with like the gear shift knob and work your way out i, I like the tire i, I i'm kind of kind of got yeah. a thing about tires <laughs> A lot of the other custom parts on it, the grill and the bumpers, they're very toy-like in the original kit. And something had to be done with that, and the illustration actually called for Camaro bumpers. Mm. When it said Camaro, I, that's when I got the idea of doing the split bumper design. Gave it kind of a new, new look, but still kept the original, you know, that it would be recognizable as a 61 Chevy. And I did a brass grill, the headlights are out of brass tubing with MV lenses front and the rear. Um, the bumpers actually have marker lights and backup lights, turn signals carved into them. They were little pieces of colored plastic that I would, you know, you drill out a bunch of holes and then whittle it out, stick the plastic in and sand it all out to flush fit it. And that was, that was kind of a neat little detail in it. The dashboard that you chose for that, that was a 59? It was the dashboard is out of a 59 Impala. Most customizers don't backdate things. They're always trying to put newer parts in it to make it more modern. And I just thought that the 61 and 62 dashes were just so boring looking. And, oh, and in yeah. fact, I actually had a 62 dash in it and I'd cut out the glove box and I was going to put some details in it. And I said, this is just not what I, you know, if this car was blown up, what do I want to look at? And I was like, I want a 59 dash it because it's yeah. so so much cooler looking and, and i have cool a 59 piece. impala up here that still needs a dashboard <laughs> <laughs> okay javana's question is and it's always an embarrassment for all of us uh how, how many different kits did you get parts from for this i usually don't like to uh, admit that oh i i wear it on my sleeve this one has at least a dozen any kit i look at it as just simply parts yeah. it is just a collection of parts and Am I going to build an AMT 57 Chevy? No, I, I, I'll take every part out of it and put half of them on a 61 Comet. I look at every part and I say, is this the best part? I mean, j the console in this car came from a 67 Chevelle. And I have a 67 Chevelle over here that doesn't have a console. <laughs> That's what's one of the great things about model car building is there's literally millions of parts with an infinite amount of combinations to put them together. That's one of the things that I really enjoy about them. Are the seats from another GM donor kit? The seats, um, again, I was just pulling all of the parts out of the, the latest tool cars at the time, and the um, 57 Ford Fairlane had a all-new tool custom seats and you know, the front and rear seats. And I didn't like the front seats, so I carved all the headrest out of them, ground all that out, kind of reshaped them. And, you know, these were brand new parts, the, the drivetrain in it, all from the Yinko Camaro, another new kit. We were getting all these new, new tools that had scale fidelity that we really hadn't seen before. So the 69 Camaro also has a lot of the suspension parts, the rear axle. Steering is all functional to the steering box or articulates with the pitman arms. And that was kind of a neat thing that I could pose the wheels and watch all the, the steering linkage work as it would in the prototype. Wow, that, I, I did not know that. That's really cool. And, hey, and on that Camaro big block, you built your own intake? Exactly, the, the um, Troy Trampaneers 50 Buick Humongous was kind of one of the hot custom cars at the mm -hmm. time. And I just loved the engine in it. And, I said, okay, that's what I was going to put into the Coralora. And Scratch built the intake. Um, it features a crank-driven front-mounted distributor with an electric water pump. All of that kept all the accessories and all of the ignition down low, and it cleaned up the top of the engine so you don't really see all the wires and that kind of stuff. I, I did plumb out all the fuel injection because I thought a lot of that stuff was kind of, kind of neat.
Your inspiration for this evolved from an illustration the Tom Taylor. Have you been influenced by other illustrators? Is that often the muse, the bump you have for starting a project? I wouldn't say it really, you know, a sole illustration. It's I kind of pull from everything that I look at. I'm always just absorbing this car, that car. How can I mix this with that? Um, you mentioned one that I built from an illustration, my 61 Comet backwards bubble top custom that was made from a Jeff Allison illustration, but it was a totally different car. And I had the <laughs> illustration on my wall for years wanting to build that model and he used the 62 Cadillac. I've been hunting for a 62 Cadillac for years and as you know, those are quite pricey to cut up into something. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I I found that the 61 Comets nobody really wanted, and I could pick them up at the swap meets for $15, $20 a piece, and I amassed a collection of them, and I was like, okay, well, this is kind of a weird car, so it got turned into the backwards hot rod bubble top. <laughs> I think what you did with the Comet was really cool. You still recognize it as a Comet, but it's just so far from the original. It was a lot of fun to build on. Researching that car, 61 cars just across the board were, it was a weird time in automotive styling. Kind of were coming out of the, the 50s and they didn't really know what, what it was gonna be. And it was this transition period. And, and the Comet was actually gonna be the baby Edsel. And when the Edsel, line had tanked ford had already had the tooling for the for the comet and they were like okay what are we going to do with this and it got rebadged into a mercury after edsel went away in 1960. builders that influenced you well there there are so many builders that have inspired me i already mentioned of course you i was fortunate to to meet pat covert at a pretty young age and tommy may and a lot of the the people that were building models in my hometown, Andy Lowry. Throughout the years, so many other modelers I've gotten to meet and get inspiration from. Steve Boutet, Ken Hamilton, Adi Scano, Ted yeah. Chopper Lear. You know, I was yeah. real good friends with, you know, I'm friends with all those guys. We would swap stories and say, hey, what do you think about this? And do this or do that. And, oh, this is going to be hard. We'll try this. That might make it easy. And so that gives the confidence and you got to, Break out that exacto knife on that fresh paint and trim that foil that you didn't really want to put down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. So from 27 years ago, how have you changed as a creative model builder? I'm still just trying to build something unique that nobody's seen before. That's kind of what the goal is. I look at a lot of model cars, you know, what inspires me? If you build a model car, you're gonna inspire me. And then I say, okay, how can I do it a little bit different? Make it unique, make it my own car. And that's what I try to do. In Toledo, you had your car on display with lighting. Back in those early Toledo days, that show would have 800 models on the tables. And it was in this jam-packed room yeah. and a lot of really nice models would simply get lost on the table. I wanted to build a simple display for it that wasn't obnoxious, but would you know set the car apart a little bit and kind of tell something about it. So once the name was kind of picked out and I had this coral theme going on, I went down to the local uh, aquarium shop and picked up the little aquarium pieces here. And I had the shells left over from an old beach trip and I built the box out of mat board, glued together with liquid nails. I had the idea of sinking the mirror into it so you could see everything up underneath it. I was also working at a grocery store at the time and they set up this Alka-Seltzer display and it had these flashing LED lights in it. And this was like high tech for 1994 for a grocery store display. Yeah. And I, and I was just mesmerized by it and I was like, that is the same length as the model. And so I went to the manager and I was like, uh, I, I, I kind of need this alka seltzer display. <laughs> and he, get, he he raises his eyebrow and he's like, what for? I said, I got an art project. And he's like, okay, we'll just take it. <laughs> and so then I cut the display apart, put the flashing lights in it, 
And that was kind of neat because it has a neat effect up underneath the car. All my model buddies were like, oh yeah, those are your subliminal lights that say vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something special on the license plate? Yes, um, it was kind of funny. That is not the original license plate that was displayed on the model in Toledo when it debuted. I had photo reduced my Alabama antique license plate to go uh -huh. on the model. And it, on the front, it has a photo reduced heartbeat of America's yesterday's Impala. That was like this style of the time as everybody had those on the front of the cars. After the Toledo show, it, it was quite shocking that it was voted best of show. And so when I brought it back home, I made a new tag that says in an L16 on it. Nice. That's, that's been what's on it since then. In Toledo, one of the things you mentioned was when you display the car and the hood and the trunk lid are open, you end up with these angles where from a side view, there's a rhythm. That was planned. I worked really hard to make sure that the trunk and the hood were open at the same angle. And then you also have the angle of the upsweep in the car on the character line. And that was the angle yeah. that I was trying to mimic. And then it also picks up the swoop of the top is mimicked in the treatment of the patterns underneath the trunk lid in the hood and also on the door panels. True artist, carrying it all the way through. Number three, cohesive model, which is really, 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 really,